your town, your station, your voice. Afternoons on Callum FM. Listen online at callum.fm. It's the Andy Snowden Radio Show. 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 Show. It's the Andy Snowden Radio Show. Show. Gold, lovely. You are listening to the Stage and Screen Show with me, Andy Snowden, here on 105 Calon FM in the heart of Wrexham City. Right, where can you take your gal this week? Now then. Coming up to Theatre Cluid on Tuesday of this week, Tuesday the 25th of October, running until next Saturday the 29th, is a brand new adaptation of the classic comedy, The Lavender Hill Mob. This one stars TV comedians Miles Jupp and Justin Edwards of The Thick of It. And uh, I caught a word with Justin Edwards yesterday afternoon, and I started by asking Justin about the last couple of years, the lockdown, and whether they managed to keep working. Well, there's one thing really. Miles and myself are doing the, the play at the moment. We're rehearsing another play with the RSC. We're supposed to be doing the, the Comedy of Errors. <laughs> we did sort of six weeks rehearsal, and we're ready to start, and then lockdown happened, and so we never did it. So it eventually got rescheduled, sort of year and a half later but then we both were unavailable for it so we uh, managed to fully rehearse a play that we never performed in front of an audience so that was a bit yeah an interesting but a bit of a waste of time and then uh, it wasn't i uh, i didn't suffer too badly during lockdown tv stuff was up and running fairly quickly so i managed to get sort of work in and get by but you know having small children and schools being shut i think all of that it was quite a yeah it's quite a strange time yeah, to say the least. Um, yeah. And this uh, th- this is the uh, the stage and screen show, and, and I think you might be the the ideal guest to have on uh, on such a show because, as you say, I mean, you've worked on the TV, film, radio, podcasts, uh, right across the board, really. I mean, you must be the envy oh, yeah. of every performer right. in the country. <laughs> Not quite. I don't know about that. Well, that's the problem. Every actor is just envious of the other person. But, yeah, yeah grass is always greener, isn't it? But no, I, I can't complain. I do enjoy. I do. You know, lucky that I do quite a lot of TV which is good fun and lots of interesting comedy things and you get to travel and meet people and see the world it's very uh, very good but it's nice to be it's nice to be back on stage although it's a you know it's a different discipline and it's very tiring and it's travelling around and all these other things it's you know there's nothing as much fun as being in front of a live audience every night and sort of doing your stuff so because uh, yeah TV for all of its you know all of its advantages and financial advantages it's quite boring to make it's quite sort of uh, it's quite a long Think the sitting around all day kind of process. It's never, it's never that glamorous. Well, so, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I hear that a lot actually. From uh, you know, because I think people on the outside looking in, TV and film looks like the place to be. Whereas yeah, anybody in the business, they say theatres. That's where the thrill is. It's right? more fun. No, TV is really sitting for eighteen hours a day in a car park and then <laughs> working frantically for about five minutes. That's that's what your day is, and then you know, and <laughs> it's always up against it. Whereas with theatre, at least you kind of you go right. We start the show now, and then that's the fun of it, and it's the same, yeah, yeah, same kind of same hours every night. So it's nice, and it's different every night as well because you have different audiences and people act in different ways, and you discover different little bits about the show as you go on. And yes, yeah, so it's always, yeah, always good fun. Do you find that uh, different parts of the country react differently to different bits of the show? I know you only just started this tour. Yeah, we've just started. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure yet what the reaction is going to be. A lot of the other uh, cast members who've toured around some of the other venues we've gone to before are all sort of full of praise. Go, oh, this whole, the audience is theatre clue, they're fantastic, the audience is involved in a fan of people great. Yeah, I think it all depends on the, <coughs> excuse me, the sort of, sort of local support of the uh, of sort of local theatres, really. And I think ones that are sort of well-run and have good, loyal audiences are always fun to play because people will turn up and... Uh, turn up and support you sort of no matter what I think they're very and always very you know happy to have a nice sort of varied bill of things to come and see so yeah yeah they're a bit more jaded down, down, to, down towards London everyone's a bit oh we've seen all this before we've got all these other places in our doorsteps so you have to work a bit harder than maybe well, I do <laughs> but uh, yeah yeah I get that but I've got to, yeah. uh, I, I have to have to ask you about the thick of it because, yes, uh, sure. I mean, if anybody ha- hasn't seen it, it, it satir- satirises the British government, which I think you know where I'm going. Um, well, it's kind of un- undoable today, unfortunately. <laughs> or even, even about, I think, sort of 
eight years ago, Armando was saying, oh, we couldn't make this again because, you know, the government's gone beyond parody. And that was, uh, and that seemed reasonably, you know, you look back to what, what the government was doing eight years ago, it seems reasonably stable. Yeah. Whereas compared to what we've got currently, yes, you really couldn't, you couldn't write a satire in which you have sort of four different prime ministers potentially in a year. It just feels kind of well, absolutely you'd, ridiculous. You'd think it, it, if what had happened this week was in the thick of it, you'd think they'd gone a bit too far. No, exactly. No, we pushed it a bit too far. But you've overdone it there. No one's going to believe that. No, it is absolutely, no, yeah. absolutely extraordinary. I don't, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen next or how we'll escape from this mess, but we'll wait and see. Because interestingly, I also did um, a few things in the This England a series on Sky. Oh, yeah. Which we filmed during, during lockdown. So that was very interesting to be part of that and watch that whole sort of Boris Johnson sort of story being told as well. So, yeah, I feel like I've been quite mired in, in sort of political comedies and dramas for the last couple of years. Well, I suppose you're the man to ask them because um, there was a kind of the crown element to that where people weren't sure whether how much of it was actually true. Yeah, how much of it was fictionalised. But it was all fairly well researched and based on they had lots of sort of inside knowledge. <laughs> Excuse me, but of course it is still a it's a sort of fictionalised ish version of events because no one really knows exactly what he's said in cabinet meetings or exactly what how you know Boris speaks to his family or his estranged children or something. So there's a certain amount of artistic license, but it's all based pretty much on uh, available sort of available facts. But also at the time we were filming it, all the stuff about the party gate and indeed uh, no, the Dominic Cummings lockdown was covered in, but the um, yeah. the Blanca Castor with all the party stuff hadn't come out and we filmed it obviously before uh, Matt Hancock's resignation as well so any deals with the story as it was known up to there so whether they, that would have changed it a lot I don't know well I thought it was a bit of a rushed ending I've got to be honest <laughs> I mean we loved it in our house I think it's uh, fun. Yeah. I think it's going to scoop a lot of awards that thing because uh... I think it was very really I mean it's a huge the breadth of it and the kind of you know and those extraordinary sort of care home scenes and all, you know the amount of stuff he filmed and yeah. put together in, in sort of in, in a short space of time and so soon after the event was kind of it's interesting I don't know if it's too soon or too late or whatever but I think you know as much as it divided people's opinions it's very watchable yes very interesting so, it yeah. is very watchable I, I, I tell everybody to watch that it's uh, it's it's superb um, I was going to ask you about British comedy because um, it, it seems mm -hmm. to me that uh, it's in a rather strange place at the moment uh, I'm not too sure when it started I mean a, a lot of things that you yourself were involved in they wouldn't get made now as you've just said um, mm -hmm. like the peep show I couldn't imagine that even getting uh, getting commissioned now but what, what what's the general consensus around uh, comics these days is there a is there a pressure to to, to kind of please everybody, I don't suppose you can really, but no, to not, not a really. fan, for one, for better word. In a way, yeah, it's a very good time for comedy because there are so many places to put it. I mean, even sort of ten years ago, in state, you know, you had BBC Two, BBC Three was a sort of slanted slant towards the youth thing, or Channel Four had its own particular. I mean, it, it sort of cyclic becomes that that broadcasters sort of fall in and out of love with comedy. For example, we don't have any. Um, uh, barring Mrs. Brown's voice, whatever you might think of, we don't really have any live audience sitcoms at the moment. They're just not in favour. People go, oh, they never work. Yeah. They're too expensive, or we can't do it. And yet, some of the, the most extraordinary things that America makes, like all the things of incredible, the Big Bang Theory and Friends and Seinfeld and Frasier and all these brilliant live action sitcoms that they do very, very well, but we don't quite replicate that success over here. But the most loved things in this country, which are, you know, Only Fools and Horses and Dad's Army and all, you know, are all really good classic live audience sitcoms and that will come round again in sort of five or six years you know, with the black hours or something there'll be another slew of them and then the broadcasters will say this is marvellous this is all we want is live or, you know, they're yeah. very so they're very fickle but they come and you know, things come and go and there was a very much a taste for which the office kind of held it slightly sort of edgier darker naturalistic humour and that was in vogue for sort of you know four or five years and then people wanted very warm hearts there was a sudden Turning point, but I think Miranda's sitcom, and they said we want you know warm hearted, fun things, and then we've dropped back from that, and now they want sort of slightly edgy, dramatic things. I don't know if you saw Daisy May Cooper's Am I Being Unreasonable, which is a brilliant series, which is you know that sort of is an interesting mix. You know, it's comedy, drama, and the League of Gents do their thing. So there was actually quite a lot of different stuff around, but I mean, tastes and fashions come and go, I think. But, um, but also in terms of, I think stand up comedy is very well represented on TV, which it wasn't traditionally for years it was never felt like it had a home there but netflix does very well for <coughs> excuse me those kind of things and amazon make good i mean there are just so many more people making sort of high-end glossy television programs that it's uh 
yeah, and obviously the, the the desire at the moment on most of the Netflix things seems to be you know, crime dramas and Jeffrey Dahmer things or <clears throat> you know crown style reenactments of of whatever. But I turned to uh, yeah, I don't think it's a bad time to be making comedy on on television at all. I don't. I think people will worry hugely that there's a great level of censorship or all oh, you can't say or can't do. But really, I don't think that's the case. People know where the line is, and you know, yeah, some people choose to cross it, and some don't. And yeah. I think there's there's more sort of hysteria whipped up around certain you know supposedly awful things people have said than you know, which are usually taken out of context as well. So absolutely, and I think because yeah. the thing is, I I blame social media because it seems to be the advent of so- social media that's kind of wrecked yeah. it for everybody. Because when we were kids, if you didn't like something, you didn't you just didn't watch it. You didn't say no, exactly. that, that can't no, happen. I, I must immediately go onto social media and say how terrible this is. Yeah. Also, with comedy, people get very very angry if you watch a bad drama. And there's plenty of those around as well. People go, oh, well, it's not, not for me. I'm not really into that kind of thing. Yeah. I'll see what else is on. If you watch a bad comedy, it doesn't make you laugh. You, people get really furious. There's a real sort of, well, that didn't make me laugh, so that must be awful. Yeah. And it's a very subjective thing here. There's lots of things that, you know, I love my wife doesn't, and vice versa, and the kids watch that I think are terrible, but they roll around in hysterics. And you just think, well, can your tastes change a lot as you get older or different opinions of the world or different views? So it's, it's yeah, like you say, it's worth remembering, but, it's all subjective, and you can just turn it off and go, John, there'll be something else. We're in an extraordinary age where you can pretty much watch anything you want, wherever you want, at any time yeah. of the day or night. So they have this kind of, oh, I can't believe I had to sit through this. Well, you didn't. You could have just turned it off and found something you liked. There's no, uh, yeah. Yes, no absolutely. <laughs> and, the, the, uh, you know, they brought back Friday Night Live. It'll be interesting to see how that is taken these days, uh, whether it'll just be a one-off or whether there'll be a series of those. I really enjoyed yeah, Friday Night Live. I, I loved it as a kid. Well, I did a revival of it oh, 15 years ago. It was a one-off Saturday Night Live, which went out uh, Saturday Night ITV, um, which was just a one-off thing. And that was good fun, and good fun to do, and it was quite interesting. They had nice stand-up and stuff on it, but they, I don't whether or not there's an appetite to do it every week. And they're quite sort of big production numbers to do and those kind of satirical shows i mean have i got news for you still sort of does the job quite well and the mass reports very good and there's lots of other yeah but also top, those topical humor things because obviously mars used to do the news quiz and i used to do various you know satirical things on radio 4 it's uh you know because the news turnovers that much quicker now it's, it's almost impossible to be funny and topical and satirical because whatever joke you thought of would probably have been on twitter said by a hundred other people anyway by the time it's yeah. and uh, the day, if you record a program on thursday night as well as the because the i know some have i got news for you writers who were panicking yesterday going oh she's now resigned at thursday you know we're recording the show tonight yeah who knows what <laughs> we have another promise to buy tomorrow or yeah my wife did the news quiz last week uh and she said it was a Thursday night because so much happened on Friday. By the time the program goes out on Friday evening, it's already it's already old news. It's already dated. So it's, well, yeah, my my son said to me last night. He said um, that somebody from Mock the Week had said, "You know what's going to happen? We're going to record the last show, and then she's going to resign." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then yeah, I can't mention no. Yeah, it's a difficult one. That's but that immediacy of social media does yeah it does beat everyone to it. Yeah. Funny enough, I was I was talking to my dad this morning actually, and I told him that I was going to be speaking to you, and he said, um, he said, oh, do you remember uh, Jeremy Lyon, right? Oh yes. <laughs> and I forgot all about Jeremy Lyon and the Twelve Days of Christmas. We, when I first saw that, I thought it was the the, the greatest uh, <laughs> version of the Twelve Days of Christmas I've ever seen. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's certainly it's it's yeah it's it's keeps going that which we did that in two thousand. It's nearly. I know, right, that 2002, I think it was 20 years ago, I think, I actually sort of put that, that together for, for show, sure. and I still trot it out every year. Yeah. I didn't do it last year or something, but, I mean, we normally get asked to do a few at sort of, you know, charity things or they all sort of call me then, but it's, um, yeah, it's become a sort of required viewing for people. It's like, oh, that's my Christmas treat, I'll, I'll watch yes. that every December. Yeah. And there's so many, there's quite a few versions of it on YouTube now. But I'm trying, I did a bit of Jeremy Lyon stuff over lockdown with some sort of little Twitter videos, uh-huh. and I'm hoping to uh, do a new show at some point whenever i get once i finish touring this one and uh and try and find something new to do with it because i sort of miss 
I miss dressing up and uh, uh, smashing the stage up and belching. <laughs> it's, quite, it's a nice way to spend an hour. So, uh, <laughs> Brilliant. Well, obviously, I can't play that on the radio, but I advise anybody to go on YouTube and have a look at the 12 Days of Christmas. Jeremy Lyons. Oh, it is. Jeremy Lyons. No, yes, yes, yes. Quite uh, a lot of him. Somewhere else. But uh, we we better talk about the Lavender Hill uh, mob because yeah. otherwise I get into trouble. Um, on the road at the moment, as you say, co-starring with the uh, yep. fantastic Miles Jupp. Um, Miles Jupp. It's uh, it must be apart apart from anything else, it must be just wonderful back to be back in the theatres. It is. It's lovely to say to be back on stage and see audiences coming out and enjoying it because I think people have been tentative about coming out to theatres or not looking so much in advance, worried about what the next sort of you know, another wave of COVID or whatever. But um, yeah, it's a very it's a good show for these troubled times because it's it's completely divorced from current life. It's set very firmly in the fifties. There's no political or social or any other agenda to it at all. It's just a nice escapist sort of romp for a couple of hours. And I think people are very grateful to sit and watch that in the, yeah, the current climate and go, yes, let's not, let's not worry about anything else for a bit. Let's just yeah, enjoy ourselves. Yeah, but it was a movie, a massive movie in 1951 was, yeah. with yeah, yeah, Alec Guinness and Sid Jam. I mean, a massive, what a, what a, what a, a, a cast. You, you'd be Thank looking God, to get yeah, this cast these probably. days. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Bob and the Bat yeah, are all dead. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's a great film. Since I watched it, obviously, again, and it's, um, no, they're fantastic as the evening comedies. But also, again, it is sort of near 70 years old now. Yeah. So it, shows, it does show its age a bit, but it obviously, you know, it holds up pretty well. But the, the, the kind of comedy of these is so much sort of slower and sort of gentle in a way. So it's, um, it's finding a way of getting that on stage without losing the, the spirit of the original, but also giving it a bit more, a bit more pace for a sort of theatre thing to try and keep it sort of running. Yeah. And it's, for it's everybody, hard, yeah. sorry, say again. Yeah. No, we just said it's our thing. So to put a film on stage as well seems seems like it's you know an almost impossible thing to do. So we've yeah. hopefully we've hopefully got around that. Well, that seems to be uh, being done a lot these days. It, uh, there's a lot of uh, films. There've been quite a few. Well, there've been quite a few healing comedy ones. That there was a big adaptation of the Lady Killers a few years ago, which toured in the West End. The Man in the White Suit they've done recently, and a few you know there's all those. Yeah, yeah, it, it can be done. I saw the Rain Man a few years ago, and I thought, how's oh, oh, this going to work? Yeah, and it was good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah no, there were a lot of kind of interesting... Actually, someone did do a... They sort of did a stage version or a music of the Shawshank Redemption. That didn't quite work. Right. Some of them, yeah, some, not all of them. Yeah. <laughs> not all of them were great successes. All of that. But uh, Back to the Future seems to be doing big business. I think it's doing very well, yeah, and I think yeah. those musical adaptations of, of shows like that are very, very popular. Yeah. Uh, let, let's stop advertising them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, don't go see them. I wish I'm Come and see that. you. If anyone hasn't seen the uh, or, or knows about the uh, the Lavender Hill mob, could you give us a quick uh, quick scenario? Yes, mild mannered bank clerk Henry Holland, um, whose job it is to oversee for bullion transportation for them, the Bank of England. He's supposed to sort of sit in a van and make sure it doesn't get pinched. And it's it's around nineteen fifty, nineteen forty, nineteen fifty. And he's always dreaming of how he can steal the gold, but there's no way of smuggling out of the country until he meets up with a man called Mr. Pendlebury, played by me, uh -huh. uh, who has a has a souvenir-making factory, sort of making um, Eiffel Tower paperweights and those kind of things. So they come up with a plan to steal the gold, melt it down uh, into Eiffel Tower paperweights, and then ship them all abroad, and then they can flog it off to various unscrupulous things and make all the money back. So that's their... That's their plan, and, and how it works, and how it goes awry. You'll have to come and see to find out. Or you, if you've seen the film, you'll probably know. But it's um, yeah, it's a very sort of daft romp through this sort of post-war London things, and then they go over to Paris, and they have to change. They get into various you know, issues, chased around, and uh, and uh, it's all told um, from Rio de Janeiro to make it even more even more confusing, which is where <laughs> where the story's set at the start. So we do it as a sort of play within a play, where the local the members of this expat club. Enact, enact the story of Henry Holland's daring bank heist. Yeah. Fantastic. So it's a lovely, yeah. yeah. It's good fun. It's a lovely ensemble of people, a really lovely cast, and it's been a real, real hoot to rehearse and fun to do. So, yeah, it's, it's very, a very enjoyable evening. Well, you'll be in Theatre Cluid uh, next Tuesday, 25th until That's the right. 29th there, of October, and then weeks, yeah. all over the place. It's a, it's a big tour until then the end of, to, yeah, yeah, end of Cardiff, next year. Yeah, Malvern and all over. And then we get a bit of time off over Christmas because all the theatres are booked up with Panto. Uh -huh. So we, we stop for a few weeks, which is quite nice, actually, we get some Christmas break. And then we start up again and go to um, Glasgow and Cornwall and a few more places like that. Although, yeah, so it's quite, yeah, we're going zigzagging up and down the country. 
Fantastic. Which would be nice. Yeah. 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 I look forward to seeing it. Actually, I'll, I'll pop up to see it's fluid and uh, I check this. one. I, 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 I like. I love the sound of this. It's. Uh, yeah. I love a comedy. Everyone needs a comedy right now, right? Oh, absolutely. That's what you need. Yeah. No, it's no. It's very, very nice escapist. Brilliant. A couple of hours to sit and sit and chill for Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Justin Edwards, it's been an absolute treat to speak to you this afternoon, mate. Thanks ever so much for that. I really appreciate it. No problems. Thank you very much indeed, and we look oh. forward to seeing you at Theatre Clue. Lovely, looking forward to it. Thanks very much. Cheers, Cheers. mate. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. So the Lavender Hill mob is coming up to Theatre Cluid this Tuesday, the 25th of October, running until Saturday, the 29th of October. That's next Saturday. Uh, to get some tickets, box office number for Theatre Cluid, 01352 344 101. 01352 344 101. Go on, support your local theatres, ladies and gentlemen. They won't be there forever if you don't. Your town. Your station, your voice. Afternoons on Calon FM. Listen online at calon.fm.